the part I'm most excited about, and I told the team, is my favorite part, is rolling up our sleeves and going into Q&A. So if you have questions, which I'm sure many of you do, you can start thinking of them now, and we're gonna light these microphones up in the aisle. So feel free to start standing up and walking towards the microphones right now. Um, my only request for the Q&A, my only request for the Q&A is the more honest the questions, the more challenging the questions, the more fun it's gonna be. So we can talk about whatever's on your mind. We can talk about things I learned in the interviews, um, things you're dealing with at work, things you're dealing with at home, if my mother's still speaking to me, it's all fair game. Uh, but we'll get it started. And feel free to start standing up and lining up at the microphone so we can uh, move them quickly. I'm gonna come down. And again, whatever is on your minds, no question is off limits. It is the closing, so feel free to start lining up. Yes, sir, what's your name? Me? Sorry, it's, hard. Yeah. it's really hard to see yes, with sir. all these lights. <laughs> Welcome to my life. Uh, first of all, I just what, wanted to thank you so name, much. Sir? Oh, my name is Chris Hill. I'm from North. Chris? Chris Hill. Let's all give Chris a round of applause. Okay, I know, you know, it's still the morning time, but it's our closing day and we're like a family now. Like we love him. A big round of applause for Chris. Hey, Chris. Uh, first of all, I'd like, like to thank you for coming out. Um, I think there's many self-proclaimed high uh, performance experts, but you are a true and proven one. And thank you so much Very for coming. You. Thank you, Chris. Um, Chris is a, a plant from my mother. Um, <laughs> thank you, Chris, it means a lot. Uh, my question is kind of a two-parter, and if you can't answer both, I understand for time, no problem. Um, it seems like you've had a lot of help from your friends in your life and those around you. And sometimes I feel like I struggle having a good close friend group that can help push me to achieve more and to be better, to give me that elbow when Larry King's in front of me. And so I'd love to know how you kind of create that circle of friends and those that support you and I, I assume you support them as well. Um, and then also I wanted to talk about um, your time trying to get with Warren Buffett. Um, and I believe from you know some stories and in your book you talk about it was just so difficult to try to get him to answer that one question about the list. And so it just seemed like there ended up being a lot of elements of luck because this guy led you astray. Uh, Dan, what, his pseudonym was Dan Babcock, yeah, that's right? right, yeah. Yeah, so he led you astray and you just went for months on this bad information. And so, and then to even ask him that question, it took a lottery of drawing your ticket out of a bucket, is that correct? That's right. And so, how do you hedge what is lottery versus what is feasible? Because it seemed like there was still an element of chance in you finding out that you were going down the wrong path. You could have gone down much longer. So I guess my question, the second question I had is, how do you hedge your risk and your bets and how do you try to figure out how to navigate the luck factor in your career and in your, and in your course? Thank you. Chris, what I'll say to you is, and I, 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 tell me if I'm right. I actually heard three questions. Tell me oh, if I'm sorry. right. Ready? Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's good because I heard one question about cultivating friendships that lift you up. Mm -hmm. I heard a second question about what I learned from that disaster with Larry King. True. And then I heard a third question about how we calibrate for luck when it comes to playing to win. Does that Correct. sound right? Yep, perfect, thank you. I, to be honest, I normally don't do this, but those were three 10 out of 10 questions. So with the audience's permission, are you guys okay if I answer all three of his questions? Okay. Chris, I'm gonna give you a hug, man, because... I, I love you too. Oh. One more time for Chris. And, and I'm serious, I, I hear a lot of questions. I've never heard three questions where all three, I'm like, how do I not answer that? Um, so Chris, I appreciate you being so thoughtful, and I think it's a testament to the kind of group we have today. Now, um, I got, I got very emotional because, um, 
And we can lower the house lights. I think we're going to spend the whole time on Chris's question. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, Uh, the friends I've been lucky enough to have uh, have been perhaps one of the biggest blessings of my life. And before I even answer the question directly, um, I'll take it a step further. Great friends are the ones who are with you when things are going great. You're on the up, you're on an adventure, you're having a good day, they're the people by your sides. The best friends are the ones who help you at your lowest. And the ones who are family are the ones who show up without you even having to ask. And on one of the lowest days of my entire life, when my dad passed away from pancreatic cancer, on the day of the funeral, in the Jewish tradition, we have eight pallbearers carry the casket. And we had assigned who the pallbearers would be, you know, carrying the casket um, to the hearse. But by the time the hearse went up to the cemetery plot, because of the chaos, um, those pallbearers weren't there. And I got a bit worried, and the rabbi came over and started talking to me and my mother. And by the time I looked up, my best friends, who I grew up with, had stepped in and were already carrying my dad's casket. And The most I cried that whole day of my dad's funeral was in that moment. Because it wasn't tears of grief, it was tears of gratitude. Because if you're lucky enough to be in a position where people who don't have to be there for you are there for you, at your lowest moments, you have one of the greatest gifts in life. And Chris, when you were asking that question, uh, that's all I could see. And I think your question, we could talk about business for the next hour. And I think nothing would be more important than what you just asked. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I didn't think this would turn into a therapy session, but uh, I'm grateful. Um, Chris, I want to give you a practical answer. Um, because you're asking about the most important thing in life. Uh, there is a famous quote um, from a, a great writer where he talks about his analogy for a successful life. And this is his analogy, and I think this is helpful for a business just as much as it is about making new friendships. And the quote says that in life there's two major seasons. And if you think about it like you're floating on a river, there's times where you let the water take you where it's supposed to take you. And you trust and let the river flow where it's going to take you. So there's a time for floating, but there's also a time for swimming. Where you know I need to go there and you give it all you got. Because something inside of you tells you it's time. So there's floating and there's swimming. Now, Chris, what I'll tell you is when it comes to cultivating friendships that lift you up and that make life not just more fun, but actually more meaningful, because that's our goal here, what I would say is three things. Number one is you need to know when it's time for swimming. When is it time for you to say, I want friends who care about their health and wellness? And you think, who in my life, or that I maybe don't even know yet? Really, I respect the way they care about their health and wellness. I want to swim towards them. Who listens to podcasts about business growth? Those are people I want to spend time with. You know, there's that new person who just got hired at the company who's obsessed with 
you know, Malcolm Gladwell books. I, I want to go spend more time. I'm going to go ask him out to lunch. I'm going to go ask her out to lunch. So you're swimming. That's number one. Number two, there's a time for floating where, you know, I'm just going to let life just come my way and see what happens. But the third part is the one people don't think about. And I don't recommend it often, but I also highly recommend it happens at some point, which there will be a time in life, and it's happened to me a couple times in life, where you look around who you're with, and something inside of you says it's time to swim away. Because there are certain things that don't align with where I'm going. And that's the hardest thing, to swim away when you don't know what your new friend group's going to be. You don't know where your new tribe's going to be. But you know this one is hurting your soul. There's a great quote I heard recently that said, you know, show me who your old friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Show me your new friends and I'll tell you who you're going to become. And it's that last part that's the hardest but the most important. Um, all right, Chris, for the Warren Buffett question. Um, I'll do the luck one first because I'll make that quick. The best analogy I've learned about how to optimize for luck in business comes from Chi Lu, the person who invented the Bing search engine for Microsoft. He was the president of online services. He created Yahoo Shopping, Yahoo Search. And Chi Lu grew up in poverty in China, in a village outside of Shanghai, and became the president of one of the biggest companies on earth. And I asked him, how does luck play a role in life? And he looked at me and he said, luck absolutely plays a role in life, but just not in the way you think. It's not a lottery. It's much more like a bus. And he explained that life is like a bus. Luck is like a bus, where you have to show up to the bus stop, and every now and then the bus rolls up. And even if you miss that bus, if you wait around, eventually another bus comes around. But he said the one thing people forget is if you're not prepared, if you don't have your bus fare in the form of preparation, no matter how many buses show up, you will never be able to get on. And that's how luck works in the business world. Now, we'll wrap, because I know the, the time's coming down, we'll wrap with the final story about uh, Warren Buffett. And again, before we dive in there, I just want to take one second, because I know the Health Trust team has spent all year preparing for this event. So can we give a giant round of applause for the Health Trust team and all the people front stage, back stage, who have made this possible. They have been working all year to give us this opportunity, so I just want to say how grateful I am to be able to be with all of you in this closing. Um, all right, we're going to finish on one final lesson that we got from Warren Buffett um, in probably the way I wanted least but needed most. Because what I wanted was to sit down in a comfy chair with him and ask him my interview questions. Apparently, life decided that I needed something different. And I'm a big believer that life is perfectly designed for your growth. Everything that happens good, everything that happens that's painful, is perfectly designed for your growth. Now, what happened with Warren Buffett, as I told you guys a little earlier, is I ended up spending eight months writing letters to him. The answer was no. So I decided with me and my best friends to go to his annual shareholders meeting in Omaha, Nebraska, and in front of 30,000 people, ask my interview questions to him during the Q&A portion. And there are only 30 people allowed to ask questions during the Q&A session. And it's a random lottery. But from what I've learned, nothing in life is completely random. So me and my best friends, six of us, went to Omaha, Nebraska. We figured out how the lottery system worked. And we figured out a loophole to Warren Buffett's lottery. And out of the six of us, four got winning lottery tickets. And that's how we asked our questions to Warren Buffett in front of 30,000 people. The only problem is Warren Buffett's a pretty smart guy. And he figured out exactly what we were doing. And by the time my 
final friend went up to the microphone, Buffett just ended the meeting right there and shut off the mics. Again, I'll never know exactly what was going through his mind, but um, it seemed pretty clear from my perspective. But that's not where the story ends. As life has it, another bus of luck came around, and I ended up getting my interview with Bill Gates through a completely different avenue. And the interview with Bill Gates ended up going so well that at the end of the interview, Bill Gates' his chief of staff looked at me and said, Alex, we love your mission. How can we help? And let me tell you, when Bill Gates' his office asks, how can we help, you take out a very long list and you hand that over. It's like showing up to business Santa Claus. You hand that list over and you pray. And Bill Gates' his chief of staff looks at my list of people I want to interview and goes, and by the way, I'd been working on the project for two years and barely making progress. Bill Gates, the chief of staff, says, oh yeah, we can get all these interviews in about a week. You know, the choir is singing hallelujah. And then he goes, oh, you want to talk to Warren? Bill and Warren are best friends. We'll take care of that one tomorrow. However, I'll never know exactly what happened. But one week later, I get an email from Bill Gates' chief of staff, and it says, Dear Alex, please no more contact to Warren's office. Thank you. And I realized in that moment that not only was I still rejected, I had gotten myself blacklisted. And every business book talks about the value of persistence, but no business book talks about the dangers of over persistence where there is a such thing where you knock on the door so many times not only do you not get in they put a deadbolt on and call security and I had to learn one of the hardest lessons in my entire life but one of the most important lessons when it comes to playing to win which is that persistence is not about knocking on one door a hundred times it's about knocking on a hundred different doors it's about knocking on a hundred different doors. And I had dug myself into such a deep hole that even Bill Gates couldn't pull me out. And that was one of the most important but the hardest lessons I've learned on the entire journey. 